We're going to be in Colossians 3 uh, once again, really as a follow-up to something that we did last weekend. Uh, Many of you were here last weekend and got to celebrate in the act of worship to the God who moved in people's hearts to get baptized. And some of you got baptized. And and for wherever you fit into how we engaged in that in that weekend service where we did the baptisms, very grateful to announce that uh, the last I heard, we had over 40 people decide to get baptized, give their life to the Lord in a public way. And um, I know there were even more people that we didn't get to baptize based off uh, the, the people who signed up and some people didn't get to come and some people didn't quite get to the baptismal. So we have work left to be done. There are some of you uh, here this morning who have yet to make a commitment to Christ, and, and we're so glad that you're here because today's message, I hope, will give you another invitation to, uh, to receive that uh, invitation to follow Jesus. And really, the reason I start with baptism is because baptism is one of those strange uh, ceremonial symbolic acts that sometimes can be so exciting and joyful that you forget that it's really just the beginning of a process. Baptism is the, the moment by which you say, I am going under this water to let go of the old life apart from God and come out of the water in the newness of life of the Spirit of God in me. And that, that moment is really supposed to represent now a life committed day by day by day to letting go of the world and clinging to Christ more and more and more. And in a similar way, we need the reminder that that really awesome celebration gets messy after. In fact, midweek, our midweek service where we take communion, we had people who were at that service stand up who had been baptized. We just celebrated. We, we cheered them on. And uh, I got the reminder from one lady who had been baptized that uh, just because you get baptized doesn't mean that Following Jesus and life is going to be really smooth and easy. In fact, you're just getting started. Maybe the, the, a better way to think about that picture of the ceremony turning into a process is the picture of the ceremony of a wedding. And weddings turn into a very lifelong uh, process by which you have to continually learn how to let go of singleness and embrace the commitment of a relationship. And for you married people here this morning, you know that that is a process that you will never be able to complete. <laughs> it, will, it will follow you day by day by day. Um, and it's really important to remember that. Because just like the wedding day, you want it to be joyful. You want it to be the most exciting day. As the pastor who gets to officiate so many weddings, it's my heart to be part of the very best day of this young couple's Life. It's like, let's make the, 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 the outfits perfect and the flowers and the food and the, the ceremony and the music and the dancing and the families coming together. And you, in fact, can, and I've been to enough to know that you can go to a perfect wedding. Sometimes you're like, that was perfect. And when I think about last weekend, you can go to a baptism that just went well. It was like, what was that last weekend? We were singing God's praises and I was crying with people and I couldn't hold that back and, and people were just excited to come out of the water and, and I laid my head on the pillow Sunday night and I thought that was the perfect church service. And just like a wedding day can be perfect and a baptism can feel perfect, there is no such thing as a perfect marriage. The, 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 the wedding can be beautiful and perfect. The marriage will always be messy. And it'll take hard work and it'll take commitment. And so it is in the life of someone who has gone through the initial ceremony with Christ and now they've made a commitment to grow more and more and more in love with him. And that's what we're going to talk about today because I think that's what Colossians chapter 3 is getting at. It starts with verse 1 that says, if you were raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, meaning keep going. The job is just getting going. It's just getting started. You've let go of your old life. The water has cleansed you. And now you are with Christ in the newness of his life in you. So seek him. Well, I already sought him. I found him. It was the cross of Christ that saved me. It was the empty tomb that gives me hope of a future resurrection. Continue to seek him. Continue, husbands, continue to seek your wife. Wives, continue to seek your husbands. It is a long and drawn out process. And so we're going to do a follow-up to last weekend's service for any of you who 
got baptized so that you would know that you did not sign up for a perfect life with Christ now. If any of you felt discouraged that that was not a magical moment between you and the Lord, because even though the baptism was perfect, Monday wasn't, and the week was hard, and you had all sorts of things to remind you that you still have some things that God wants to cleanse out of your life, I want to speak to you this morning. And I also want to speak to any of you who have ever been baptized. So let's go before the timeline of last week back to the longest ago baptism that exists in this room. Some of you may have been baptized by Charles Spurgeon himself in the late 1800s. And you still need to hear this message. You need to hear the message that you are not yet perfected in Christ. And then there are some of you who I hope will hear this message as another invitation that God is sovereign. He has brought you here to hear of his great love and his plan that goes so far beyond a church service for your life. It goes to the directed steps and purpose and passion that he wants to put into your heart. And then he wants to take your life and shape it and mold it from this day until you see him face to face. And if you've never made a commitment to follow Christ, I hope this gives you a better understanding of what that commitment actually is. In the same way we walk young couples through a premarital discipleship uh, 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 class so that we would say to them, when you get married, here's what you can expect. Well, to any of you who would not consider yourselves followers of Christ, and you come here as you would come to a wedding, and you're looking in and thinking, do I ever want to get married? Or do do I really believe in that as a process that I could see myself? I hope that this message will prepare you for a more realistic vision and commitment of what the life of Christ actually looks like. This is a narrow and difficult uh, way that Jesus calls all of us to, knowing that whatever challenges will come through our cleansing and building up in Christ will be far outweighed by the glory that waits us in heaven. So we're going to talk about a few things this morning that will be a commitment that we make beyond the ceremony. In, In many ways, when we do a wedding ceremony, you say, now go make this commitment until death do you part. And that is the commitment we make to Christ. And this, this sermon, I hope, will, will set forth a, a new vision of the commitment that we have made to actually belonging and walking and growing in Christ as believers and as a church and families that make up this church. So we'll talk about a few things, starting with a reading of the, the first half of this chapter. So read along with me in verse 1. If then you were raised with Christ... If then you've been baptized, referencing what Paul says about baptism in chapter 2, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of earth. For you died, past tense, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then also you will appear with him in glory. Therefore... Put to death members which are on the earth. And when we say put to death, we talked about this as the invitation to be baptized so that anyone who goes through that ceremony would know what the water represents, a putting to death of all of the pursuits of your life apart from the will of God. But know that this death is a lifelong process. We are all being called in new ways to commit to a leaving of the old natural inclinations behind us. And he gives us a list. Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God, meaning the right justice we all long for, he will punish all of the ways that evil has crept into our world. And it's coming upon anyone who still lives in the disobedience of those sins. In which you yourselves once walked. You used to live in those things. Your baptism gives you a day by which you say, that's the old me. I don't commit my life to that anymore. We know that those things are still being washed and they can stick to us like Velcro. But now we believe that we can, with the power of the Spirit, continually go more and more and more towards the process of getting rid of these in our life. But now you yourselves are to put off these things, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Don't lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds and put on the new man which is renewed in the knowledge according to the image of him who created him. You are now living according to the image of God that we see in Christ that now lives in you. It's a lot to take in. 
But Paul says that now we have the image of Jesus. This was the intended design for all of us. In Jesus, the fullness of God dwells. In Jesus, we have a visible image of the invisible, immaterial God. In Jesus, we have the model of the perfect life, he who knew no sin. And in Jesus, we don't only have a picture, but we also have the power, the same spirit of Christ now living in us. So we make this commitment primarily and first focus of next step after baptism, remember where you started. We, we must never believe that baptism now is a religious act that we have done, and now we're in a church, or we're in the kingdom of God, and our name is written in the, in the book of heaven, and now we go about our business as usual. There is a process by which we accept Christ, and there is a process by which Christ consumes all of who we are, and our identity, more and more and more, is no longer in ourselves as Lord, shepherd, king of our lives, in our own passions and lusts and dreams and visions for our own life, but we now, because of Christ in us, have a vision for our life that is informed and empowered by the Spirit of Christ. And that is why we come to verse 11. Very powerful promise of the kingdom. And this is why I love belonging to the kingdom of God. It says in verse 11, In Christ there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is now all. Now, and that's, to me, what, one of the rallying cries of the, of the pains of our world right now to try to find a vision for humanity that allows everyone to coexist in harmony with a common vision and goal. And for the believers among us, we, we hear the, the cry of the world and we say, we have found that. We have found a community where I look out and I say, you all belong. I don't need to know where you came from. I don't need to know what you did. I don't know, need to know all of the things that God is working out in you specifically. I know that God so loved the world and made it possible for the whole world to be brought into the one kingdom that is on its way in full, united by the power of the Spirit of Christ to love one another. And it doesn't matter what tribe or country or identity or West Coast state or East Coast state you came from. In Christ, we are now all one. So one of the first foundational reminders of following Christ is, remember, it's all about Jesus. And that's one of the ways that maybe we can get tripped up about baptism. It's like, okay, I've been baptized, and now I'm going about my life. And I'm going about my different preferences and my different cultural uh, tendencies and all of the things that are still real about you. But now you have a primary identity in Christ Christ in you. And this is how the marriage metaphor will actually weave itself in and throughout this sermon to try to understand what the baptism and sanctification process is like. We really can see the wedding and the marriage process because what does Jesus say about getting married? He says, when man and woman come together to become one flesh, to be so united that they're considered one entity, that they have to leave their mother and father and cling to each other that a man should leave his mother and father, no longer that family as his identity, and now he has a desire to be in oneness with his wife so much that that is his new identity, his new family mission. His, his new tribe is the man-woman unit that has been brought together through marriage. And we get that picture in the church. You're no longer part of that family of the world or that country of the world. Now you're a part of heaven. And, and that process gets really messy. That's why we have to remember to, to, the, to the young, uh, desired, married people among us, your first year of marriage is messy, and this is one of the reasons why. Because you are learning how to have a new identity as a married person, not an identity as a single person. Not an identity of your old family and an identity of your new family. And there's an example of this in my own marriage that I always think of when I think about a brand new tribe that I belong to in Christ. I had to bring a brand new tribe just to have one family in my life. Uh, when I had to go through this process because my... My wife, I hate, I hate to put you on blast, Daniela, but she's right there, and she's from Colombia, which means that we came from different tribes, and I love your tribe. But it did cause us to question how our new family was going to look. And one of the ways that we're still processing working that out is in the traditions that both of our families had with food. So I grew up uh, the grandson of a, uh, a Great Depression uh, steel worker who was grateful for every, every tiny scrap of food that he got, which manifested into our family feeling like if you didn't clean your plate, you're wasting food. So take small portions and come back for more. 
Now, the, the Latino culture, which is, is much more loving in this way, they pile the food on. <laughs> and the first time I ever ate at, this is Daniela and her sister. Sorry, Lena, now I'm calling you out. The first time I ever ate at their house, her mother actually came out with two plates of food that were piled. I thought, there's two plates here. And she says, yep, because we, we love you and we care about you. And I'm thinking, how am I going to eat all that food? And so I do my best to eat it all. And I have down to my last bite, job well done. And I just, I just this, this amazing Latina woman's putting more food on my plate. Like, if you eat it all, I know you're going to leave hungry and I just can't have that happen. And, and, and it was a collision of culture. It was messy, and we have to still figure it out because as we give food to our kids, if I'm preparing the plate, they get one grape each, and you can come back for more. <laughs> and my, my wife is like, well, we ju- we've only, it was two hours since we ate, so I've got, I've got, and I'm going to need a double oven for this meal. I'm thinking, these kids are five and under. <laughs> and it's the same thing that happens in your life with Christ. You now belong to a new tribe. It is the tribe of heaven. You now belong to a new community. You now belong to a new identity. And part of this identity has a totally different mode of operandi than you're used to. Everything in our old life kind of centered around us. In our new life in Christ, everything centers around Christ. If you love me, you'll obey my commandments. My disciples will be known for their love. And if you want joy and joy more fulfilled, then you're going to learn how to love each other. And this is a brand new thing that requires the spirit of Christ in us. So step number one is stay in Christ. The whole comment that Paul is making before he gets to the practical application of Christian living with the new spirit in you is are you in Christ today? Have you committed your, your, your life and your pursuit and your, your, the love that you have for your neighbor and the care that you have for your family and the, the hard work that you have for your job and the glory that you want to give all of it to God for? Are you in Christ this morning? Are you in Christ in a new and fresh way to worship him and hear his word, knowing that his word is now your guide, your lamp unto your feet? Be in Christ on the day of your baptism and stay in Christ. It is the foundation of everything we do. We no longer have the other context. Now, it's still beautiful to have the cultures, isn't it? And one of the ways that we see our church coming back together in a new, fresh way for the year 2020 and the way that the Lord is putting the church back together is a new desire to see the multicultural church as an expression of God's spirit for our church. And I see Julio and Christy over there right now. So grateful that we now have four services. We have English. We have two English, we have a Spanish service, and then we have our international fellowship with French, Congolese, and Swahili, an English translator. Now, the cultures still exist in their context where there's language, but our desire more and more and more is to bring all of the cultures together to say those have a secondary purpose in your life still. And there's still language-specific opportunity at our church, but we are one church. They are not separate churches that meet on our campus. We are one picture of all of the tribes of heaven coming together under one king. It is all about Christ. And with that, we go to the second reminder or the second charge of this, which is a theme that comes up in this chapter specifically as Paul is taking these believers from you've been raised, now live like it. And he does this in Colossians chapter 3. He does this throughout all the New Testament. He's writing these letters to different churches that he's helping to oversee and encourage. And there's a common theme that comes up. And one of the common themes is it's all grace. It's the Ephesians church, right? It's like by grace you have saved, not by works. It's all Christ. His finished work on the cross, his life now in you is the answer to the hope that you have for heaven. So no one boasts in here. So it's all Christ. But now that we've got that as the foundation that it's all Christ, he also teaches a personal response or even to go so far as to say a responsibility that you have as a believer. Look what he says in verse 5. He says, therefore, put to death your members. He's, He's giving a charge to the people who have gone through the process of accepting the Spirit to say, now take your part. You take part in the list that is going to be written in this letter as the Holy Spirit gives you one of those words from this list. And it's like, in what way do you need to put to death fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, all of the ways that we can sin against brothers, all of the ways our words can be hurtful? In what way do you have responsibility in the Spirit of God to take part in what God wants to do to clean up your life? 
That's a good reminder for baptism sometimes because it's so powerful and it's so symbolic that you may be tempted to think that maybe there's a magic in the water. (laughs) Maybe there's something about that moment that was really what you needed to have your life change. And maybe it's just a miraculous moment. God parts the Red Sea and now the people walk on dry land and I got baptized so now I'm cleaned up and I'm good. I got cleaned up. The water wasn't holy. The water we didn't import from the Jordan River as a way to try to get the closest version of the the, the baptism of Christ that we could find. Jesus says there's some that baptize with water. I come baptizing in the power of my Holy Spirit. And if you have the Spirit, you are now called to walk by the power of the Spirit. You want an indwelling of the, the Spirit in your life day by day by day? Allow God to use your life in real life ways to where you would need the Spirit. What is it? When do you get the Spirit? Well, have you tried forgiving an enemy lately? Have you tried praying for someone who persecuted lately? Have you tried to actually take part in the grace of God, him edifying and building you up by rejecting some of these things that Paul is saying, don't do this anymore. Take it off like an old dirty garment. It smells and it's gross and take it off. In what way have you said, Lord, I hear your word speak and now I respond because I You said those who love you will obey your commandments. Here's another story for the way I see this in my own life. And it has to do with um, one of our daughters kind of going through the process of maturity, which is really what we're talking about. Christian growth is, is like maturity that happens in childhood to adult. And our third child, her name is Rosie, uh, this year uh, during the, the lockdown quarantine era when we, we were all seeing little ways that life went on and kids kept growing and we got to see one of our daughters learn how to ride a bike and we got to see one of our daughters uh, potty train and, and the same daughter, Rosie, she went from crib to bed. And that was such a, that's such a moment for her and her life, you know. It's like the crib really was a glorified jail cell. It, <laughs> it's got the bars and and for her, it, you know, she shares a room with her sisters and, and the crib, she would sit in the crib and her sisters would walk out on their own accord and she would be in there waiting for the grace of uh, myself or Daniela to come in and lift her out and set her on her way. And in, in some sense, it's almost like the psalmist cry. I was, I was in a pit and you put me on solid ground. And that's that picture of how God takes us out and he puts us on the ground. And yet something strange happened in her life when we put her in a real bed. For the first couple nights, she would sleep in that bed and the morning would come and her, her sisters would run out of the room and she would cry, can someone get me out of here? And I'm like, uh... You're, you're free. If you've been set free by the power of your father. You've been set free. The, the walls have been broken. <laughs> the chains have been broken. And she, the concept was lost on her. She's like, the only way I ever know how to get out of bed is if you pick me up and put me on dry ground. And so it took me a second to say, Rosie, go. Just, just walk. And, and eventually she got it. And eventually, after two or three days of doing that, she now is like, okay, I I'm good. I mean, I have the grace to have a bed, and now I'm walking on my own accord. And in so many ways, I see this in our Christian walk. God, save me. The baptism testimonies of the way that we're crying out for God, and he shows up. You call, he answers. You're in the pit, he delivers. By the power of his spirit, he is the present help help in time of need. Some of you feel like you're in a prison. Some of your hearts are overwhelmed. Some of you feel fearful. Some of you are crying out to God in this year in a new and fresh way, and he will meet you where you're at. Where there is trouble, we have a God who will meet us. Where there is sin, we have a God who says where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. And yet, we also have a master, a savior, who comes and gives us the model for the way that he grows in us and disciples us, and he says, follow me. Drop your nets, Peter, and follow me. Take a step in your own life to, to, to walk out of the boat and see what would happen if you kept your eyes on me. Baptism is not a magical, miracle, water moment that solves you from all your problems. Baptism is the moment that you said yes to the power of God. The chains are now broken, no longer a slave of, free, of fear. You have been adopted as a son or a daughter. And baptism is the moment that you have the ability to walk now. If you have the Spirit, walk in the Spirit. 
If you've got the power of God in you, it doesn't mean you don't have to use the power. It means now you have the ability to look at those old things, the anger, the malice, the bitterness, the unforgiveness, and you can say, I don't have to sit here anymore. Because I have the Spirit of God in me, he's given me the power to reject those things, to repent from those things, to be refreshed by the the things that God actually has for my life. So, believers, walk. Take a step towards God, and he will meet you. And we have to come in that order. I start with the power of Christ as the foundation for everything, lest you think I'm preaching works. I'm not, but I am preaching responsibility. I am preaching the reality that God is a father, and he's called us to his household, and he gives us gifts and talents to manage for his glory. And he's going to have an account, as it says, because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. He's going to give an account where justice will be served. And people who did not walk away from these things will not be able to say, well, I was just kept waiting on you, and you never gave me an answer. God has given you the power to walk in the newness of life. So one, we say, remember where you came from. And two, I say, by the power of the Spirit, be a responsible follower of Christ. We, we keep reading and we find in, um, in, this, in this model for what Paul is saying. It's, it's throughout the book of Colossians. Remember, this started, this idea started that we're being cleansed. Started in Colossians 1 when, when Paul said that you have been transferred from the power of darkness into the power of his kingdom, of his son, whom he loves. There's, there's something that's happening in your life. You're, you're, being, you're being taken somewhere. You're not simply being cleansed, forgiven, name written in the book of heaven. Now you're a neutral and do what you want. He's taking you from darkness to light, from death to life, from blindness to sight. And in this list, from unrighteousness or sin to righteousness. He's replacing all of the ways that we were walking away from him with things that he has by the power of his spirit designed for us to walk in. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 9, that he has good works that we should walk in them. And the, the reality is, is that if we think we're coming here simply to be cleansed and saved and then go about our business, we're, we're, we're not getting the full gospel. It's a two-part process. The water is your picture of getting cleansed, and then walking out of the water is your picture of what God has planned for you in the newness of life. And so for number three, as, as I speak specifically to people who recently got baptized, and for those of us who are on a reminder now of the Christian progress, overcome evil with good. It's one of the things that we see in this passage because Paul doesn't simply say put off. He also says put on. Verse 12, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and loved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all of these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. You know, I'll use that last verse that, that we read, be thankful, as an example of taking something off and putting something on. Because to me, one of the themes that God has given us this year is all of the ways he is teaching us what true praise and thanksgiving and and hope looks like. Peter says that we love trial and tribulation because it teaches us where our faith is. And for me, so many people talked about the year 2020, about the year of vision. And then we were like, well, that must have been just foolish thinking because this is the most chaotic and crazy year ever. And so maybe that pun wasn't actually what God designed. And I think, you know, now that I think about it, I've got more vision than ever. Because God is actually teaching his people how to see what he sees. And to do that, we've got to come to the end of ourselves. We've got to come to the end of our own plans. We've got to have a year that seems pretty crazy. And we couldn't walk by our own understanding if we tried to. So in this charge to be thankful, which was pretty much our whole study in Philippians, it's all throughout Colossians, be thankful, be thankful, be thankful. He's saying, take off those things that maybe keep you from worshiping God and overcome them by being radically thankful. This year has been challenging. This year has caused some of us to have kind of a fearful attitude. You know what will will change your fear? You want to know how to put off fear? You can't just say stop being fearful. How about this? Look for ways that you can be thankful. 
Look for ways that this year you can say, you know what, as crazy as it was, I never would have seen my friend get baptized if this year hadn't come and shattered all their plans. God, I see it and I'm thankful. You, you feel like maybe you've, that, that self-pity that can come sometimes set in and by no means do I want any of you to feel like there's not compassion and empathy for the challenges that this year has brought. But when we get too introspective and when we get too much uh, thinking about ourselves and we start feeling bad for ourselves and it's like, well, this year's been it's just so hard and my life is hard and I just don't see the way out. It's like, you want to you put that off? Learn how to have some gratitude. Learn how to be grateful for all of the ways that you can continue to love God, continue to love your family, continue to see a vision for heaven that is far going to outweigh whatever light and momentary afflictions are happening in the process to get us there. And this is something, again, I go back to baptism. So often we think that you know, if we cry out to God, he's going to save us for something very specific. And God does use specific burdens to save us, doesn't he? It's like, man, those stories of the testimony. My marriage was on the rocks, so I called out to God and he saved me. But do not think that God is done because your marriage is intact. He's got bigger plans than that. I was completely lost because I lost my job. I moved to Boise and all my plans fell through. I was going to go to Boise State. I was going to work at this job and I got nothing now. Lord, can you restore some of the things that I just need to survive? He'll restore it, but he won't be done. He's going to take that thing that brought you to him and he's going to replace it with hope. He's going to restore your faith and your love. And then he's going to continue to work out all of these ways that he will teach you how to be merciful, Teach you how to be kind, verse 12. Teach you how to be humble. Teach you how to be meek. Teach you to be long-suffering. This is one of the scariest moments in following Jesus when you realize that it is way deeper and way broader and way harder than what you signed up for. Putting on love and exchanging it for all of the things that we have to put off according to the ways of the world is a process that will leave no stone unturned in your life. So if your baptism, week after baptism has been hard, it's because God is now showing you all of the plans that he has, the projects that he's going to work in your mind and in your heart and in your relationships because you thought you got saved so your marriage would get healed. It, it will by God's design, and he's not done. Maybe a, the best way for me to share this is the way that I've always thought of it in a lesson that I learned from C.S. Lewis. In the way that he describes this relentless love of God that will require you to put off the old and put on the new way more than you ever thought. And he, he likens it to a dentist and the way that they clean up our uh, dental hygiene, I guess. And I've always loved that because uh, for a long time, I've, I've been a, a huge candy guy. And uh, up until yesterday, I had some candy. <laughs> and uh, so... When I think about sanctification, I'm always thinking about how to work this process out in my own struggle with that. And so when I read this, I'm like, I, I totally relate. And maybe some of you can relate to that when it comes to actually making a commitment to church, making a commitment to the Lord. And I want you to know that that commitment will leave no stone unturned in what God has planned for you. This is how C.S. Lewis says it. He says, let me explain. When I was a child, I often had a toothache. I can relate. And I knew that if I went to my mother, she would give me something which would deaden the pain for that night, and it would let me go to sleep. But I did not go to my mother. At least, not until the pain became very bad. And the reason I did not go was this. I did not doubt that she would give me the aspirin, but I knew she would also do something else. I knew that she would take me to the dentist the next morning. I could not get what I wanted out of her without getting something more, which I did not want at all. I wanted immediate relief from pain, but I could not get it without having my teeth set permanently right. And I knew those dentists. I knew they started fiddling about with my mouth and all my other teeth, and they would leave no tooth unchecked. They would not let sleeping dogs lie. If you give a dentist an inch, they will take a mile. <laughs> and so that dentist among us, this is, this is actually comparing you to Christ, so this is a good thing. So he says, now if... If I may put it in a new way, our Lord is like a dentist. If you give him an inch, he'll take a mile. Dozens of people go to him to be cured of some particular sin, which they're ashamed of, like fornication or cowardness, which is obviously ruining their daily life, a bad temper or drunkenness. Well, he will cure it all right. 
but he will not stop there. That may be all you ask, but once you call upon his name, he's going to give you the full treatment. It will take you your entire life of following Christ before you meet him face to face when he says, you're ready, job well done, enter into my joy, enter into my rest. Now my work is complete. Now you're in the full vision of the perfect image of Christ that you were designed to be. But it's going to take an entire lifetime. And now we weave the wedding ceremony and marriage back into it. Husbands, it will take you your entire life to learn how to love your wife. Continue to seek her. Continue to put off the old singular bachelor, single bachelor uh, mindset that you had before you married. And day by day, you put on the pursuit of loving her more. And now I speak to a church. Church, it will take you your whole life to learn how to love your neighbor as yourself. It will take us our entire lives of committing to worship weekly and reading the word to learn how to represent heaven on earth in the way that we come together in unity together. And this is where we'll look at our last uh, recommendation or really charge or exhortation from the word as how we continue in our commitment that the ceremony now representing the process. And this is what Paul will say to this final aspect of what this looks like in our lives. In verse 15, he says, And let the peace of God rules in your, rule in your hearts, to which also you were called, in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. He says, in everything that you do, do it together. Grow together more and more in the body of Christ, taking part in the plan that God has to have Christ as the head and the church as the body. And that is where we belong. We belong to a commitment not simply to follow Jesus, but a commitment to grow with each other. That's why he says that let it dwell richly in you. Teach each other. Admonish each other. Sing songs to one another. Share hymns and psalms together. He says, you really want to commit to following Christ the rest of your life? You better commit to people. Why is that so important? I was an incredible husband before I got married. I was the best. I was like, my goodness, this is going to be easy because I'm chill and I'm nice. And I think about all of the, the marriages I looked in and I thought, I'm not going to do that. But, you know, something happens when you actually have to live it and you realize how much help you need and how much grace you need and how much growth and progress you need to go through. In the same way, I was an incredible dad until I had kids. <laughs> and the job got a lot harder once I made a commitment to not giving up and actually doing it, practically growing picking myself back up and asking for God's grace and wisdom to learn the process time and time again. It will take me my whole life to learn how to father my kids. And I was a really good person until I made a commitment to allow Jesus to be the standard of my life. And then as soon as I saw the standard of Christ as the life that now I'm pursuing, his love as the template of love, his joy as the template of joy, his vision for loving enemies and people who persecute and caring for the least of these as now my vision for my life, now I know how much growth I have to do. And in the same way, I don't know what it's like to forgive a brother, to go through the process of caring for a community of Christ without being part of a church, and you won't either. You won't know the need that you have for God to continually cleanse you, to teach you forgiveness, to teach you how to overcome bitterness, to teach you how to build each other up and not compete against one another, to teach you how to not gossip until you commit to an unconditional love for the community that God has placed you in. We need each other to know how we can grow and to know how much we need the Spirit of God in us. So we make a commitment to these things in our life. And I will say this for the journey, for all of us who have been baptized and believe. Uh, it says in Proverbs that the righteous man falls seven times, 
and he gets back up. So I'm so grateful that it is by grace that we are saved, and it is by grace that we grow. This is not a message to say to any one of us, why aren't you getting it? This is a message to say, do not give up. Do not give up on all of those times you see a new way that God is turning over a, a stone in your heart and, and teaching you how to, to repent and, and be refreshed and be grown up. Don't give up. It's a good thing. And I think sometimes we beat ourselves up when we feel the growing pains and we feel like we're slipping and we're falling down. And just know that if you feel the growing pains, if you, if you just found out that you, you slipped again and you're thinking, why did I do this? This is what it means. It means you're in the game. It means that you're actually allowing the Spirit of God to convict you. It means you're actually allowing the Word of God to be your template by which you will continue to allow God to give you grace to grow into the standard of the Word of God in your life. So do not give up. And I just share these with you again. It's all about Jesus. It starts with the foundation of Christ in you. And then we know that it's, God has given us a responsibility. As Mordecai says to Esther, who knows? This could be your time. This is why you're here in Boise, Idaho for 2020. God has a call on your life. Respond by saying, I will put off the old and put on the new time and time again. Overcome evil with doing good. As God gives us the power to put off the old, let us not think that it is for no reason. If you want sin to diminish in your life, it means that you desire the, the spiritual fruit of Galatians chapter 5 to grow in your life. And as one weakens, the other will strengthen. As we reject sin, we have to be strengthened in righteousness. And then it says, or, or then we say, leave no stone unturned. We say, Lord, here we are again. You saved me because I was crying out to you in a specific way, but you're not done with me. You're still working on me. Allow God to have new access to the depth of your heart. Renew your mind in a new way. There's no relationship that's off limits in the Lord. There's no community that God doesn't want to see more and more built up into the perfect image of heaven on earth. And remember that you belong to the body. Your life is not your own. You've been purchased with a price. If you're not a believer, I hope that you hear this message as an honest view of what Christ is calling you to. It's all free, the gift of God. The grace by which you are brought into this community is apart from your own work. This is the gospel message for you this morning. We would love to see you say yes to God in simply saying, Jesus, my life is no longer my own. I want your spirit to dwell in me, and now I walk with you. And for all of us, May we worship with a new commitment to follow Jesus. The same commitment that I saw in the hearts and the minds and the stories of people coming out of the water, I, I, I pray over you now that we would be just as excited today about our first love as when we first believed.